Today is the free day, okay, uh, to talk about any subject. Uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, all of you have the opportunity to tell me what subject you would like me to talk about, and I'll consider uh, any one of those topics uh, that you would like me to speak about, okay? Uh, but since, um, you know, I didn't see anyone suggesting any particular topic, uh, I have one. And this one is in reference to the people that, um, that go around saying everything is haram. They're like, haram, 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 haram. You know, and these people don't have knowledge. And they're running around saying everything is haram. And they don't have knowledge. You know, um, if you ask these people, you'll find out that they don't have the authority to be saying something is haram. And we could even talk about later about the people who say, kafir, 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 bid'ah, 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 bid'ah. You know, we have many groups of people who give themselves the authority, uh, you know, um, to make a judgment, you know, uh, a fatwa, you know, and give hukum, a decision on things, and they don't have the qualifications or the authority from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to do this. But they do this. They go around and they're making fitna. You know, they don't realize it, but they're making fitna. And even in Surah the Baqarah, it talks about those people who say, oh, we just want to make peace. But in reality, they're making mischief, and they realize it not. So these people need to stop that. I mean, clear proofs I'll give you so you can see that these people have no authority. Ask them, do they know all of Sahih Bukhari by heart? All of the hadith in Sahih Bukhari by heart? Do they know all the hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim by heart? Do they know... Um, uh, Fatul Bari, the tafsir of the hadiths in Sahih Bukhari. Do they know um, all of the Quran? Have they memorized all of the Quran? Do they know Asbab and Uzul, the reason for each ayat coming down? Do they even know the Arabic language? Do they know it well enough to know the Arabic language as it is in the pure Fusha? during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Do they know the conditions in which these ayats came down? Do they know when these ayats came down? Do they have all of this type of information? Do they know the chain of narrations in regards to hadith? Do they know the difference between a daif hadith and an authentic hadith? Do they know the difference? Do they know the difference of a, a hadith that is completely rejected? And why it's rejected? Do they know about the differences of opinion and the ikhtilaf? Do they know all of this? And yet they're going around saying haram, 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 haram. I call these people haram police. They make themselves the haram police. You do something, they say, yeah, uh, yeah, that's haram. You need to stop that. You need to be aware of that. That's haram. And so there's another aspect. Even if they knew everything that I just mentioned, they may not have any knowledge of the thing that they're given a judgment on. So in that sense, they still would not have any authority to speak on that matter. Until they thoroughly know, after having all the knowledge that I mentioned, that they thoroughly understand and know that which they are talking about. Because they may give, even if someone went to a sheikh or a scholar and they gave a scenario and saying, uh, yeah, sheikh, I want to know um, if someone does this, this, and this, and this, is it haram or halal? And the sheikh may not be given all of the information. So based on the information that he was given, the sheikh will say, oh, that's haram. And so he takes it back and he runs around 
That person is doing something haram. That's haram. That's haram. That's bid'ah. That's shirk. That's kufr. That's this. That's that. And they didn't even tell the sheikh everything. And they didn't tell the sheikh correctly. So that the sheikh could make an, an honest judgment based on that. Even when we talk about the Prophet Muhammad who didn't have knowledge of the agriculture. He had knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. But he didn't have knowledge of the how to do things agriculturally. And so when he gave his opinion on something agriculturally, it was wrong. And Allah did this for a reason to teach us, you know, that each one specializes in knowledge in a certain area. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was given knowledge in a certain area. In terms of our life, in terms of our deen, in terms of family life, in terms but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give him the knowledge of agriculture. You see? So the Prophet was not the one that could give the information on how to um, to raise crops and how to do this and the, in the same lesson we learned in the lesson of Musa and Khidr when uh, Musa gave a lecture and they said oh wow yeah Musa does anyone know more than you and Musa thought well if Allah sent the revelation down to me then no one must not have any more knowledge than me so he said no but Allah taught him a valuable lesson he said yeah Musa there is someone Allah revealed to him that there is someone someone who knows something that you don't know and so Musa was shocked astonished and he wanted to go and find out and get this knowledge that he doesn't possess and when he found Khidr, he approached him as a student, not arrogant. He was a prophet of Allah. Musa, one of the greatest prophets of Allah. But he humbled himself as a student to someone who had knowledge that he did not possess. So you shouldn't, even if you become a scholar and knowledgeable of Quran and Hadiths and Tafsir and all of that, don't think that now because of that you can be an English teacher. And everyone should listen to you. You should be a mechanic and everyone should listen to you. And you should be a scientist and everyone should listen to you. No, in the area that you have knowledge, people should listen to you. In the area that someone else has knowledge, he, people should listen to him. And that's a lesson that we should learn from the lesson of Musa wa Khidr. And after Musa traveled with Khidr and found out that there were many things he didn't understand and didn't know, and he wasn't patient with it, then Khidr began to teach him as to why he did each thing and then he concluded by telling Musa when a bird came and took a peck of water out of the ocean or the sea and Khidr said to Musa do you see that which the bird took out of the water the knowledge that you and I combined possess is no more than that peck of water that that bird took out of the sea compared to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many ayats and verses in the Quran that talk about that even if the trees were pens to write with and the oceans were ink, that it would run out before the, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to understand that and humble ourselves when we talk about things we should not be so arrogant to think that we know everything when we haven't even studied everything and we have we don't you know subhanallah I'll give you another example some people don't even know because in their country they have certain um, they'll go with a certain imam maybe imam malik or hanafi or hanbali or shafi you know the four imams so some countries go with one of those imams and some so go so far as to not want to marry someone who is um, following a different imam and yet we're all supposed to be Muslims you find people going to that extent when all of those imams were just doing what trying to give us the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah so we should be going back to the source when Allah subhanahu wa ta said to us in Quran so if you really believe if the first of all our source or foundation is the Quran and the Sunnah and the Quran is the example of the Sunnah and you can't separate it that's why even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about following what the Prophet said right 
Unless Ben Tyler said, um, talking about, well, first of all, Unless Ben Tyler says, Allah wa Tiyo Rasul. So you have to follow both. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, May yuti Allah fakad atta'ala. May yuti Rasul fakad atta'ala. May yuti Rasul fakad atta'ala. Whoever follows the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. May yuti Rasul fakad atta'ala. So the obedience of the Prophet is is the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's Allah who tells you to obey Allah and His Messenger. It is Allah who tells you that if you obey the Messenger, you have obeyed Allah, then you have obeyed Him. So the Sunnah is the living out, the implementation of the Quran as the wife of the Prophet when they asked Aisha anha, mu'mineen, about the character of the Prophet and she said, Quran, that His character was the Quran. As if the Quran yamshi al art, as if the Quran was walking on the earth. So you can't separate the Quran and the Sunnah. They go together. They are one. And you know, you can't even tell me how many rakahs to pray, you know, by looking at the Quran. You can't give me the details of offering the salat by looking at the Quran. Because the explanation and implementation of the Quran is a sunnah of the Prophet. Sallam. Everything that he said did and approved of. Otherwise, there will be no need for a prophet. Allah could have just sent a book down and we just all read it and live by it. No, but Allah sent the Prophet Sallam in order to explain to us what he has revealed to us and to be an example to us of how to practice that. So from that, we get the sunnah. We find out how to live our lives. So the four imams were only trying to help us to get to the Quran and the sunnah, to understand the Quran and the sunnah. And that's why Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim was compiled so that we can avoid the weak or, or false hadiths of the Prophet You see? So how many people know that? So Saul may be in a country where it's their method from the madhab, you know, to make the du'a kanut before the ruku, And another people to make the du'a kanut after the ruku. And you may find these two people arguing. No, no, you're right. No, no, I'm wrong. No, no, you're wrong. No, I'm right. Right? So arguing over who's wrong and who's right. When yet they didn't realize that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did both. Sometimes he made the Dua Kanut before the Ruku. And sometimes he did the Dua Kanut after the Ruku. And then you'll find some people, for instance, when you go down to Sujood and you put your hands down first. Or do you put your knees down first? How many people know that the Prophet also did both, but in his earlier life, he put his knees down first, and then later in life, he put his hands down first. And most of the scholars go with what he did last as that which we should do. And not only that, the Prophet even said, do not prostrate, do not go down as the camel goes down. And the camel goes down with his knees first. So how many people know all of this? so that they know what's the right thing to do. Sometimes you can do both. Sometimes it's one or the other. Sometimes something was in the earlier part of Islam and later abrogated later. How many know that? How many know the conditions in which the ayat came down? How many people know all of these different things as Baba Nuzul? How many know the tafsir of the ayat? How many know the tafsir of the hadiths? How many know the seerah? to know what the Prophet did even if you couldn't gather what you should do from the Quran and the Hadith you may be able to look at the seerah to see what the Prophet did to see what the companions of the Prophet did the best people who followed him were the ones who were with him the companions around him the righteous people around him so you can even look at them to see how should you be a proper follower of the Prophet when people were talking about shaving beards, did any of the companions shave their beards? No. So they didn't understand it the way you understand it. You know, there wasn't even one that would shave his beard. And, you know, many other things. Did any of them listen to music? No, not, not after Islam. Maybe before Islam came to the Raven Peninsula, but not after. 
And they even thought that the drums were also haram, except that the Prophet said, no, everyone has their Eid, and this is our Eid, and allowed the, the girls to play with, on the duf, on the drums. So from that, we know that the duf or the drum is okay, but the other instruments, the wind instruments and string instruments, are not. And that they were grouped with the, uh, the, the sins of the last days, where people would be drinking alcohol and playing you know, musical instruments and all of that. So how many have a complete knowledge of Islam to be able to make a proper un judgment and have a proper understanding in order to be able to tell anybody anything? So a person should hesitate running around saying, that's haram, that's haram, that's haram. And then on top of that, when you run around telling your children or whoever what's haram, then you should be telling them also what's halal so that they would know how to avoid the haram. But if you close a door in somebody's face, but you don't open a door to another space that they can travel on, you're trying to prepare for their destruction. Because if someone needs food, and yet he has no money, and you say stealing is haram, but you don't give him charity, you don't give him sadaqah, you don't help him out, you don't get him a job, and you say it's haram, and you want to go ahead and cut his hand off. So you've closed the door to haram, but you didn't open the door to halal. And this is what we should be doing. That if you run around and say what's haram, first of all, know what you're talking about. You should know what's haram and what's halal, and you should know the thing that you're talking about. For instance, somebody was going around saying, oh, you know, um, someone is in a business that's haram. Oh, it's a pyramid scheme. And then when they were explained about it, they realized it wasn't a pyramid scheme. Because a pyramid scheme is something where there is no product or service and everyone pays and then everyone gets paid by the people paying up under them in a triangular type of way. But there's no product and there's no service so the people in the end, when you, can, when you can't get any more people, they've lost their money. They didn't get a product or a service. So if you have a product or a service, you can sell it. If you have a product or a service, you can pay those who help to market or advertise it. So that's not, a mark, that's, not a, that's not a pyramid scheme. And people don't know those differences. What about riba? People don't even know that. What's it, like in the Quran where someone said, oh, business is like riba. No, but Allah has permitted business and forbidden riba. So do you know the difference between business and riba? Do you know the difference between interest and business? You need to know those differences if you're going to be in business. All right? So, and then you need to know, are those people dealing in that in that business? You may come to find that they're not. So you need to know what you're talking about before you even open your mouth to say that something is haram. And then, even when you correct a person, you need to know the etiquettes of correcting a person. Because if you go into public and say, yeah, fulan, fulan, that person, that person, such and such, is doing things that are haram. He's doing things that are haram. She's doing things that are haram. Don't go with them. Don't listen to them. Don't join them. Don't do this. Don't do that. Oh, he's a kafir. She's a kafir. Oh, you know, when you do, bidda, he's in bid'ah. When you do these types of things, then you don't even know the way of correcting people. Because you may be slandering them. Because what you're saying may not be true. If you actually sit down with them and talk with them, you may find that what they're involved in is not haram. Or what they're involved in is not kufr. Or what they're involved in is not bid'ah. But you didn't do that. You ran around talking bad about them be behind their backs. And in public, even in front of their faces. And so you are slandering them. That's called slander. When you say something that's not true, the Prophet Sunday made that clear. Because they asked, well, what if it's true what we're saying? Well, if it's true, then you are slandering that person. Slandering that person. Slandering their business. Because you're saying what's not true and you didn't get the knowledge information to know that that's not true. And you didn't take the time to even listen to them. Or to have a dialogue. You didn't tell them what you think they're doing that is haram and give them the proof that what they're doing is haram. You didn't do that. Are you really trying to help them? Are you really trying to guide them? Or are you trying to elevate yourself as some sheikh or scholar and, and stepping on people's heads and pushing them down in order to elevate yourself up? If you're really concerned about them, you would take them to the side privately and say, Ya Akhi, 
this is haram because of this, this, and that. You tell them why it's haram. Do you think you're the only one that wants to go to paradise? Do you think you're the only one that doesn't want to do something that's haram? Are you, are you the only one uh, that doesn't want to make a mistake? Most of the Muslims, we want to go to paradise like you do. Most of us don't want to do the haram like you don't. So give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Pull them to the side and tell them what they're doing is haram and why it's haram. And you may come to find out that what they're doing is not haram if you at least try to do that. And then that, that is in order to avoid the backbiting. But if it was actually not haram, what you were saying, now you're involving yourself in an even greater sin because you're slandering someone who is not doing something as haram. So you need to be careful too because doing that is haram. Slandering people is haram. Backbiting people is haram. So you need to be just as careful as the people that you're warning to be careful. You know? So this is very important. So don't appoint yourself to be the haram police because you may find out that you are the one that are actually in the haram and you are the one who actually will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are the actual, actual one that will be handcuffed and thrown into the hellfire because what you are saying and doing is haram and spreading fitna and mischief and corruption on the earth because of your bad habits of going around backbiting and slandering people without knowledge. And even when you correct them, not trying to correct them with edit, etiquette and ihtaram, with respect and etiquette in the way that a Muslim should be. We should be hiding the faults of our brothers and sisters, not trying to expose them in the public. Guarding the image of Islam because the more you try to attack the Muslims in public the more you're putting a negative image on you and the way of life that you claim to follow which is Islam. Do you think people's going to say oh Ahmed is good. Oh but Muhammad is bad. No they're going to say those Muslims. Those Muslims. Those Muslims. That Islam. So you should be guarding that the name of Islam, guarding the name of Muslim, guarding the Ummah and trying to help correct the people privately to keep the image of Islam clean, not throwing dirt, not throwing filth on it because they're not, the non-Muslims are not looking at that person as an individual but they're looking at us as a whole, as an Ummah, as a community, as Muslims in the religion of Islam. All of us are representatives, and so all of us should be realize that we are part of a whole, part of a bigger community, and our job is to protect it all and not try to filthy or dirty that image of all or anyone in it because it will be a reflection of all of us. Okay, that's the end of this um, uh, class for today or this talk for today. All right, if you appreciated anything that I said, Give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa tubilaik.